Welcome to another episode of Left on Red Podcast. I am Jen, also known as Booking Jordan. And I'm Dwayne. All right, so today we're here with another podcast episode, Left on Red, which now we are on Apple and Spotify. So go ahead and search us if you're watching via YouTube and you want to hear this um, on either Apple or Spotify. Just search Left on Red Podcast. No spaces in between Left on Red. And you'll see a picture of Dwayne and I. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so we're back and we are back discussing an amazing memoir manifesto by George Emma Johnson. And it is All Boys Aren't Blue. You might have seen this roaming through the Twitter timeline feeds. I don't know. Have you seen it, actually? I've seen it, yeah. Come across. I feel like... um are they making it into a movie or something, or are they doing something with it? I saw Gab, you know Gab, that's my girl. I saw that Gab um, got the rights or something. Let me not misspeak. It's something going on with it. It's going to yeah, be adapted into something, something. But yeah, I've seen a lot of people talk about it, plus the cover of it kind of stands out. The cover is beautiful. That really, you know when they say judge a book by its cover, I really do be judging books by its cover. Mm. Because, not in life, maybe a little bit, but on um, books, I definitely do it. Because when I saw the cover... I was like, wow, that's a beautiful, catchy cover. Like, something about it just, if you're scrolling, you just want to stop on it. Like, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Plus, the title is kind of like, what does this mean? Like, you try to figure out what what does that represent? Like, all boys aren't blue. I I get it, like, blue and pink, maybe, or something like that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. But you still want to know what does it mean because you also have like blue it's like you see talking about skin and black people and stuff like that so that's another thing i was thinking about but i'm pretty sure it was the first thing i said but i don't know we'll talk about that later maybe no but that's that's a good thing because yeah when i saw the cover i just immediately thought okay you have a boy not the cover but the title Dwayne, as you are cutting me off what i am saying is when i looked at the cover and i saw a flower piece on there and said all boys aren't blue i immediately thought gender like i just thought it had to do with something with gender or masculinity those were kind of the things that were going through my head but there are so many things in my life that i feel like have been flagged where it's like you're either in this box or that box even from the color pink it's like we could get in a conversation on when you were a kid and you felt you had to pick your favorite color like it starts literally at like three or four when someone asks you that it's crazy i remember i didn't want pink but everybody liked pink and honestly that's how my default was purple was literally because i was like no i'm not picking pink <laughs> yeah purple still kind of in the spectrum of it's still in the girl spectrum it was like the default the second default girl color but that's a whole different tangent we could probably talk <laughs> for a okay. minute on that so what are um What's the, what's the synopsis of, of the book? So the book is really George's life. Like, honestly, that's what it is. George is telling his story through pivotal or key moments in his life, um, really focusing on him identifying as a black queer man and what that meant for his life and how his whole life he was basically forced to try to conform into certain boxes whether it was masculinity or even at the same point if he's black like he can never escape from being black so you're you're dealing with like double stuff from one end you're dealing with racism and the other end you're dealing with homophobia you're dealing with toxic masculinity and all this other crap so the chapters really kind of weave back and forth between those two main focuses of race and gender okay and sexuality but yeah let me start off there because i thought the intro i thought when i love the title names of the chapters and we can go into that a little deeper but i thought it was interesting the book starts off in the introduction and george is talking about his relationship with the n-word And I just think I like appreciate that because I'm like, I think everybody has their own personal story of their relationship. Let me correct that. I think every black person (laughs) has their own relationship or story with the N word and their choice to either use it or not. And I'll I'll pause there. Um, So, Nguyen, what's your relationship with the with the N word? So, I mean, in the past, I've used it. Um, 
and in the future i may use it um what about again, the present <laughs> i'm not using it right now wait so, you aren't like at this moment i'm while i'm talking i'm not using oh. it so i have and maybe in the future i will but anyway um i was about to say it right now i was <laughs> say this and we're <laughs> that's not funny sorry but um yeah i mean i've used it conversationally um to refer to like a person in general so um, have you ever like do you ever battle or have you ever in the past battled using the n-word and if yeah, so why yeah i i think my view on it in general is that it's not necessarily harmful, but I don't think it's helpful. So I'm not one of the, um, we use it as a, we repurpose it and use it as a term of endearment. I don't necessarily like the way that's said. I think it's more so something we just feel like doing. I don't think it helps anything, but it. I don't feel like it hurts anything. Racism is what hurts stuff. I don't think our use of that word hurts anything, unless you can kind of get into... Um, like psychologically hearing that word does it make us feel less than to me no so maybe that's why i feel like it's okay to say um some good arguments i like i think that there's a there's something too when people say you know the last word that you know people probably heard when they were lynched was that word and so it's not appropriate to use i can see that um i can see how yeah so those are i think my main things Ultimately, I don't think it's helpful, but also not harmful, as, as I think a lot of the pe- black people who say don't use it contend. I actually don't really know black people who don't say to say not to use it. I've only met one. I mean, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in society and popular culture. The main, like the respectability people. politics. I think it could be part of respectability politics, but I don't think that's how it's positioned really. Like, like no, I don't. I think that's part of it. I think that's part of people's argument, but I think their argument is more of a community argument of let's not refer to ourselves as a degrading term, as opposed to if we're calling each other the N word, other people will do something. Yeah, but it's I like, don't I don't know. In that I think you use that, you could, people use that for a lot of different things. Um, the N word has a long history, which I, I clearly we all are aware of but i guess my i never had a period in my life where i didn't feel comfortable using it like i never really had a period in my personal life where i was like this isn't a word i should be using and it's interesting because i don't curse lately in my older age i have picked up curse words but i think it's interesting from my perspective because i don't curse like the the f word all that stuff to me is like oh my gosh i don't really use it like it's not a part of my vocabulary but one thing that was a part of my vocabulary is the n-word and it's even weird me saying the n-word in this podcast well why do you think that is culturally um it's culturally it's a part of um and i'm gonna go to the full circle kind of like what you did with your explanation but culturally for me it's a term that was utilized regularly in my neighborhood with my friends um this is gonna sound ridiculous but even when i was younger like i know a lot of rap songs use it but and this is probably a horrible example because i need to check the whole lyrics but tupac i'd rather be a n-i-g-g-a all that. like that's those are when i see i'm smiling when i think of it which I, I realize can be harmful for a lot of people who, like you said, have a negative experience of that. But I will say the only thing I'm clear about as far as the N-word is that only black people should be using it. That to me is a universal. I don't care oh. how many people you hear using the N-word. The only people who should be using the N-word are black people if they choose to use it. If you choose not to use it, of course not. And if you tell me you don't want to be referred to as the N-word, I would never Unless I slip up. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> no, on a real note, I wouldn't um, refer to you as that. Um, but to me, I feel like the only times where people are saying this policing, I think it's just white people. White people want us to not use it because they can't use it. And it's another thing. It's like, if I can't say it, you can't say it. And I'm like, nah, bro, I can say it. And I'm going to say it. 
for as long as I want to say it. And if I decide not to, I won't. But they're like, well, you can't expect us to not use it if it's in the songs and if it's a, and then black people will repeat those things and be like, well, that's why they're, no, that's not why they're using it. They're using it because of all the other stuff they be doing in history. This ain't got nothing, nothing I do controls what they be doing. They just be doing it point blank period there's nothing that a black person does to either provoke racism cause racism or any of this stuff it's literally something in its own category they're two different topics but the only time i hear arguments against this is we should do better so we can expect better let's be the respectability politics which is i appreciate because in the book he talks about that yeah. and oh i'm sorry no, i'm gonna hold rant no it's okay because i was gonna ask you about what his argument was about it or what his thoughts were on it so his is he was using it then he stopped using it when he wanted to basically when he was aligned with the respectability politics of thinking that you know if we hold ourselves to a certain standard and if we do better and if we you know don't use that derogatory term and hold ourselves in a different esteem and internally we'll be more respectable and you can't treat you can't expect people to not treat you like an n-word if you're saying it basically and then I think um, I think his pivotal point was Trayvon Martin, and that's when he started using it again because he was like, "Y'all, y'all just really don't care." I don't usually hear it on a personal level. I hear it more during like movements, and yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is more so respectability politics, politics in a different in a different way. So like when they said "let's bury the N word," I think the NAACP let it. Um, and wasn't a few Reverend? Years ago. Oh no, wasn't Al Sharpton? Yeah, wasn't he Al against Sharpton. it? And he was saying the N word like crazy during your um, graduation. Um, just so y'all know, Al Sharpton did the commencement speech for Dwayne's um, grad school graduation from FAMU, um, and Al Sharpton did it. And when I said he said that word so many times, I was uncomfortable. <laughs> that might have been the first time I was uncomfortable <laughs> hearing that damn word. <laughs> I was like, cut. We got enough. Yeah, the crowd loved it. Yeah, yeah, the crowd did love it. It's a memorable. I don't remember my commencement speeches, any of the ones that were giving, but I do remember his. Um, yeah, and I know my pastor. I've had a pastor say it. I mean. What about white passing black people? So I think this came up a few months ago, oh, actually. With, nah, uh, bro. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't be the regulator. Jones. I can't be the regulator on this. I mean, I'm not the, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Like if I heard Rashida Jones saying it, would I do a double take if I didn't know who Rashida was or something? Like, I think that's a little uncomfortable. And I think if you're in that, if you're in that area of privilege, you have to decide for yourself probably on how to best use it. I don't think someone in that area of privilege that can go in back and forth between worlds where 99% of the general population till this day don't even know she's black. They probably think that's a rumor mm -hmm. on the office. I don't, I don't think anything about that ever indicate, you know, it's like besides this whole, what's the black yeah. SF yeah. show? Like for people who could take it on and take it off and do all that other stuff. I don't really know what the rules of engagement are around that. And I also don't know what her real life is like either. So I don't want to make it seem like she's taking it on and off. Well, I mean, she got to get, She's trying to work, so I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm not faulting her for, I mean, you can't change, like, I'm not faulting her. What I meant by that is if you know you have this sense of privilege, I think the most privileged people are the ones who have to kind of bear that responsibility, be wise with it. So I couldn't dictate, you know, she is black. I can't dictate how she chooses to navigate, but she should realize that if she uses that word, if someone who is white passing is using that word around other black people and other black people cannot tell or know, that could be a triggering situation just to be mindful of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's like one of those things It's because it's like no matter what group you're in, white supremacy somehow trumps. Like if you're a woman fighting for women rights, white supremacy is going to trump. White women are not going to see black issues. You're going to be the bottom of the totem pole. If you're a black trans woman, you're going to be the bottom of the trope. All these marginalizations always go down and it's like white supremacy within these marginalized communities always is on top. If you're gay or um, queer within the movement, like even with starting pride like that's what started pride were black trans women and it's like even from that you're going to be the last where it's gay white males that's always going to be the top of all these different 
levels. I don't know. It just seems like all this stuff is intertwined. So the next thing the author gets into, he talks a lot about his childhood and about growing up as a queer black boy and kind of like since birth, how gender was assigned to him and how basically from there, there was confusion along where he fits in. He does stay, he identifies as a boy, but I mean, there's just so many instances throughout his childhood where he had to kind of mask his queerness and what makes him unique and special or try to conform as much as possible not because he does out of choice but literally out of mere survival like he had to do this to survive and i'm like that's just ridiculous like it's just so triggering and ridiculous for me of having to literally mask the the best parts of yourself like literally just to make it through the end of the end of the day and um that goes along the lines of toxic masculinity and um i just kind of wanted to talk about that and from your perspective growing up a, as a black boy were there any levels clearly this is going to be different if you are queer identifying um than you're if you're not or if you um portray more feminine characteristics or things that are deemed feminine so i just wanted to kind of know like what was your experience as a black boy growing up on if you felt like you ever had to mask certain things or the toxic masculinity I'll let you carry it away from there. Okay. Um, so a few things that come to mind related to masculinity, I guess, in myself that I can think of that let's say don't align. I'm assuming that was the issue that they didn't align with what's considered masculine, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You can say because like with his the way he talks, his interest, yeah, stuff of like that, that nature. Yeah. So for me, like sports. So I think that's a big thing, particularly growing up. That's a big topic and interest. I'm also fairly athletic. Although I didn't play in high school or college, um, I was able to play a variety of different sports recreationally. And that's a way of showing your masculinity as well as um, building camaraderie with other guys, um, usually other guys and some women. On the flip side to that, I would say one thing that sticks out to me maybe related to masculinity is that um, I was skinny. That doesn't necessarily matter, or I still am kind of skinny, but generally <laughs> the stronger you are or the bigger you are, people tend to associate with some form of masculinity or even hyper-masculinity. Um, I'm fairly soft-spoken. Um, that's another thing, so not being assertive or being reserved. Um, can be something that's uh, considered not as masculine, not that it's not masculine, um, but combined with a deep voice, it kind of makes up for it, I would guess. I guess after puberty. I don't know yeah, what your after voice puberty. was like I mean, before. Yeah, it didn't really matter. Um, but it's interesting when you, I want to go back to the sports topic, because that's basically a lot of what he talks about within his childhood, the sports and activities that he was into. There's a chapter specifically where he's talking about it's called the f words f words play football too and he's talking about his love of double dutch and how on the playground he would have his friends who were all girls a group of girls he had male friends as well but during um physical activity or pe um he would always go to double dutch that was like his niche and he was even though he played sports with his cousins and did stuff at that point in his life it wasn't an interest for him he got into sports merely for survival like not out of interest because it started going around that they were talking about him and he was gay and that was when he decided all right this gonna be his last time he he can't go out to do double dutch he's gonna have to play football um today and it's crazy because um this is this is going not probably not make sense but i i make playlists to books and for this chapter specifically it was knuck if you buck because i literally pictured him on that field showing out and stunting on them boys because they didn't know like you know he was just he wasn't gonna go down that day and i almost tear up just thinking about that chapter because it's like you're rooting for him and it's just it almost makes you feel sick rooting for him because you want him to almost show the toughness that he shouldn't even have to show but just for them to back up off him but it's like those type of scenarios that's when he kind of won their respect so it's kind of like even when you show those um 
characteristics that fall outside of the societal norms of male, female, the two binaries that we have. Um, well, not that we have, but that a lot, I guess, of cis hetero culture chooses to box people in to. It's like sports somehow can overcome that. That's like almost like a defense mechanism to survive. And I just find it interesting because even as a kid, like growing up, thankfully as a girl, I don't think you have it as hard. Um, but I was a girl who liked Barbie dolls. I liked wrestling. I liked basketball. I liked playing dress up. I liked um, cooking. I liked just a lot of things that fall back and forth in between things. I liked wearing dresses and I liked wearing cowboy boots and I liked wearing shorts. And I, it was just, I could just go back and forth as much as I wanted to. And I had different friend groups, but from the guy side, even the older you get, the more it's like, oh, you, you like in sports because you're trying to get a dude or you're doing this to try to be cool or be down with guys or it's always a credibility of how much does this person really know or you're not really into... Like, it's always a check thing where it's like people really feel like your gender is going to determine your interests. And it's just ridiculous. Like, your gender has nothing to do with that. Societal norms can force you into those things but how many guys would probably love dolls? Like anytime I would play dolls, like with my Barbie dolls and get my dad involved or my brother involved, I think my dad and brother were more involved. I don't remember my mom ever playing with me with it. Like she may walk by or something, but they'll get into the storylines with you. Cause a lot of it to me was acting and writing scripts and stuff of that nature and having a creative outlet. So it's like crazy that when we see a guy playing with or a boy kid playing with dolls or something, it's like a, <gasps> fear with it it's like who wouldn't want to do that like you're literally creating worlds and having fun like why mm -hmm. wouldn't you want that and who wouldn't well some people may not but who wouldn't want to get like play stuff and be in competition and like you know go off on certain things like I don't know like I never liked double dutch but I did like um dodge not dodgeball um tetherball 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 was my ish i loved racing people i loved walking the track by myself i like team sport like you could like a lot of activities and it's it's just crazy to me um yeah but it's what we do and know. sometimes even sports can't save you totally you know people still say things about certain nfl players or even when they were in college if they mm -hmm. exhibit what we consider um a female gender not gender role but like yeah characteristics whether it's the way they talk or move or you know stuff like that so that still does happen um you know to this day yeah it's like that that happens and it's interesting because it's like thankfully you know he is naturally talented or was naturally talented or gifted in athletics and sports but there's some girls who are there's some girls who aren't there's some boys who aren't there's some boys who are and there's some um you know non-binary kids who are and who are not like it's really like I really hate that there are these um, norms and that we subscribe to them in certain ways. Like even like even in my, like I, I don't know. Even with thinking with my childhood, there's just certain things that thankfully my parents didn't really subscribe to a lot of them. But how much different would it have been if it was my brother? I don't know. Like yeah, I think it's just viewed in a different lens. Um, but interestingly enough. He says, like, throughout his life, um, this isn't really a spoiler, but because I think he says it pretty quickly in the novel, but he didn't really find that area where he could really express his queerness until he joined a historically black fraternity. I thought that was just so ironic to me. I don't know. Like, for me, I was like, wow. When I think of college, there was a lot of homophobic stuff going on and culture wise it was just rampant i don't know if that's true a true statement i think it's a combination of people everybody's in a this kind of exploratory phase of their life mm -hmm. and also people are being exposed to a lot of other people that they may not have been exposed to before in their town or city or whatever so you got a combination of people figuring out who they are and then, or people people figuring out who they are, people revealing who they are, and then people just generally being around people they've never experienced before or wouldn't be likely to engage with. And so I think all of those things 
makes people's causes a clash of you know people's ideologies and so that's where you see the homophobia come out when you see the certain things like um, people would talk about at the the male version of the sororities that they had um, in Tallahassee. And so stuff I feel like, like that. people associated certain fraternities with if they were gay or if they were not, and yeah. there was a lot of talk with that. It never really happened. I guess it may have happened I a little like bit that's... with the women, but it may be a little bit. But really, I think the only openly gay people I knew in college as well were women. So one of the things along with the gender stuff, what I thought was interesting, the author relates code switching, but in the form of code switching gender wise like with gender identity and what i mean by that is like he would talk in cer certain manners that were associated with women which made it associated with being gay and he would have to suppress that and switch into his more masculine talk and speak and i was just like that is crazy like i just thought that was an interesting um interesting chapter in code switching for that identity and the only thing like I could connect with it on any level of this is like growing up, it's not the same, but clearly it's not the same, but growing up um, as Haitian in Florida or Haitian American in Florida, because like that was not something to be desired or wanted. It's like the more you could mask yourself as to not being easily identifiable as Haitian American, just the easier your life is. Yeah, and I hope you can um, expound on this in a separate episode one day. But for people who aren't from a place with a lot of Haitian Americans, it's really hard to understand until you learn more and speak more to what they really had to go through growing up. Um, so hopefully she'll do a, a standalone, yeah. maybe. But anyway, yeah, you keep, that's keep, talk, and that's keep talking about it. That's a different, that's a, yeah, you're right. That is a completely different topic than this. But when I was just hearing about his stuff, because it's like, you're not in the closet. You are who you are, but you're like struggling with um, survival mechanisms of trying to not be an easily identifiable target. So does that mean you shrink in certain ways? Are you truly shy or are you not shy? Is it more so you're scared to engage with people because you don't want to be a target? Like it's it's so many layers to some of those things yeah and i think it was interesting because it was like um there was a point where i want to get the term right right but gay by association and that is just so interesting to me because that's what made me think of it because it was like almost like you're haitian by association in certain ways where that it's just gonna sound wrong but i in a different episode i could probably go more in depth on that but yeah I think that's a, a big piece of people's homophobia. Um, people who are not, who wouldn't probably consider themselves homophobic, but wouldn't hang out or be like in public with someone who is gay, um, particularly males I'm speaking about, or who seems to be identifying with like a female gender role, mm -hmm. um, especially in a one on one situation. Um, so it's interesting that he pointed that out because I do think that is uh, a major barrier to. Um, things and I think it's still homophobic like that's a part of homophobic if you see somebody who is with someone else who is gay and you automatically are saying they are gay and even if they are they are but like it's just one of those situations where it is gay by association where it's the complete uh, opposite when it comes to girls but even in adulthood that's something that I think translates really well so that's why i liked also once he went to college and he was in a fraternity because he had um people who were queer on his line and he had people who were straight on his line and um he talks about his friendships and kind of building that first brotherhood and bond with straight black males who are straight identifying or whatever and who are able to connect on that level so like how did he find out that oh never mind that's probably too much that's spoiler you can talk about it what were you gonna ask I was going to ask how he found out. Found out about what? About other people. Oh, eventually with time of getting close and talking through. Oh, he goes yeah. through that. One thing I wanted to talk about, um, which was one of the things I appreciated most about the book, was his exploration with actually sex. Like, talking about sex. Um, it's just not something that I thought of within a memoir. But when he was talking about his experience and the fact that everything that he ever learned or saw or anything about that 
had to do with sex between a man, man and a woman. He never, there's nothing to really teach or to learn from any other way. Even mechanically, he didn't really know. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. just like a, it's like some a privilege that you just take and you don't really um, think about too deeply. Like, and I had to think like the only example that I remember of non- Something that was not heterosexual sex was um, The Truth About Jane, which was a Lifetime movie. And it was crazy because I remember, like, she had sex for the first time, so she wasn't a virgin anymore. And I, I don't remember if it was she didn't even know or it was something like, was that sex or was it? And it's like because you have your standards of what sex is in a heteronormative way. So that was interesting. I don't even know if I knew about sex at that time, to be honest <laughs> with you. But, <laughs> I mean... I knew it was something different than what I was seeing on TV before. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess there's not really much to talk about, but it's interesting because with sex and stuff, granted, I was sheltered, so I don't, I didn't really learn about sex and probably the, I don't know how most kids learned about sex, but I learned about sex from other people talking about it and just conversation, I guess from peers. It's not really something that, educationally was talked about but how much more isolated are you if you're a queer identifying kid you don't even have peers if you don't have a queer community or you're not able to be openly queer you have nobody to talk about this with yeah. granted there's the internet now but yeah i'm sure that's helped a lot of you but also harm them because you got access to the the other side of everything too. yeah but... oh did you have so I, yeah how did he get comfortable talking about all this stuff, even all the way up to that, from going from being, you know, not wanting to talk about anything? I just think this. he's a dope person because I feel like he talked about certain things that even now he realizes is embarrassing. And he says in this, like, he's going to be this vulnerable and kind of open up, even though he knows this is embarrassing because these are things he wished people told him and he doesn't want other queer kids to not have this. He literally was writing this almost like a, a manifesto in that way of saying the topics people don't talk about. So ki kids like him won't have to, will have some type of resource or have something out there. And I just thought, wow. Cause even me, I would be on, like, even on this camera when we're talking about how you learned about sex and stuff like that, that's not really something I don't think I'm comfortable necessarily exploring and talking about openly to the whole wide world but right. he's doing this out of like love and looking out for others and it's a good ass book <laughs> that's what i will say i felt like it was just the layers just got so good in the beginning i'm like i heard it before i heard it before this is good i heard it before and then it got to I've never heard this before never heard this before wow this is gonna help so many kids this is gonna help so many people and wow thank you for your story like i just i just love i love the book i loved it but yeah that was a lot the sun is going down so for those of you who are watching on youtube you're probably like what the heck but the sky is beautiful oh my god the sky is blue it and looks pink. like the background of the book i know it's so beautiful but okay was there any final thoughts that you want to say before we get out of here uh leave a five-star review or like or subscribe or whatever you're yeah, supposed to do. That, I, yeah, anyway, I need to get better it. on that. If you're watching on YouTube, please comment below and please give it a thumbs up. The engagement is so important, especially for black creators. It really is important on getting this information out to other people. And it's just, it's just important. I never emphasize it and I need to. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or on Apple, please give it five stars, five stars, five stars. And if you're about to give it a one, just go ahead and click and don't don't even don't even rate it. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but um, that's all I have. And I guess I'll see you guys in the next one. Comment below if you've read the book so we could keep talking about it. Um, or if you have any other suggestions. All right. Love and light. And we'll see y'all in the next one. Bye. You're not going to say nothing. Bye. <laughs>